And good evening. Uh, my name is Torun Das. I am uh, standing in for the executive director and CEO of Kiran Pasricha, who is uh, got a slip disc, so she's uh, not in a condition to walk around. Um, and I have a very brief role to welcome all of you here uh, to this uh, somewhat unusual subject by our normal standards of Aspen India. But in particular, I want to introduce someone uh, who is very special to me. And that is Mr. Ramadurai, who is uh, going to chair this session this evening. He and I, uh, I'm privileged that he and I go back a long time. Uh, he has served 40 years in Tata Consultancy Services. I beat you by a few years. <laughs> you know, because nobody else would have me. I hung around in CII a little longer than you did in TCS. And uh, he took the company, which was at $150 million size in 1996, when he took over as managing director and CEO, to some incredible figure of $6 billion uh, when he stepped down in 2011. He is now the vice chairman of the company. Uh, but equally important, I won't say more important, uh, since February 2011, he's been advisor to the prime minister with cabinet rank, uh, doing something uh, which needed to be done for many years, uh, leading our skills development uh, movement in the country, trying to, struggling to uh, coordinate and facilitate a much greater priority for skills development in the country. Um, you have his bio, so I don't need to give you all his educational qualifications. Uh, he studied in Delhi. He survived studying in Delhi, I should say. Uh, and then went on to Bangalore and California. And he's just one of our most outstanding uh, business leaders of this country, Mr. Ramadurai. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tarundas, and a very good evening to all of you. I think today we have one of the most uh, distinguished speakers. Before I introduce him, more importantly, the topic is of extreme relevance. Essentially, the topic is using information technology to fight terrorism and increase security. And the whole presentation centers around how you can use open source data to an enormous amount of intelligence and analytics not necessarily in the terrorism area alone, because he has applied some of these techniques to multiple areas, including education. Currently, we are in a dialogue with him to take it to a completely different space. But I think uh, there is a realization on this topic across the world about an unparalleled opportunity for data collection using media like mobile phone inputs cheap cameras and sensors, and online news, social media, crowdsourcing, etc. And then the big data analytics, which is talked today in every forum which you go to. I think these, how do they have certain policy implications? And then to look at the expected intensity or reduce the expected intensity of terrorist attacks. So I think these are some of the themes which he will center around the presentation. Now, Professor V. S. Subramanian, whom I have known for quite a while, is a professor of computer science at the University of Maryland and heads the Center for Digital International Government, having served as a director of the University of Maryland's Institute for Advanced Computer Studies for more than six plus years. He's a world-renowned expert on big data analytics, and we are so thankful to him for making it here, including methods to analyze vast bodies of text, learn models of behaviors of entities from the data, 
forecast action by these entities and methods to influence their, these behaviors. More importantly, his work has been used extensively by both industry and government, including, amongst others, methods to shape opinions in social media, influence terrorist group behaviors, and analyze educational outcomes. I mean, his system which he developed works in almost eight languages and won the 2007 Computer World Horizon Award. And organizations like the World Bank, Forbes, US military, and others have used this for real-time social media opinion analysis, which this work was later extended, him, extended by him to identify influencers on specific topics and methods to optimally spread influence in the social media. I think he has applied this to modeling of more than 45 terror groups uh, worldwide. And then uh, some of the things which he will share with regard to identifying locations of IED weapons, caches in Baghdad, and some of the provinces in Afghanistan as an example. He has edited five books, co-authored an advanced database book, a book on heterogeneous software agents, a book on geospatial abduction, published by Springer, MIT Press, Morgan Kaufman, and is the sole author of the best-known textbook on multimedia databases, published by Morgan Kaufman. He has also co-authored Computational Analysis of Terror Groups, Luxury Taiba, the first book to do a 360-degree analysis of a terrorist group using computational methods. Professor Subramaniam has published more than 200 articles in international conferences and journals. I think he has been cited as one of the top 320 most cited computer scientists of all time. He was named to the top 20 best computer science mentors in a worldwide survey by the Indian Institute of Science in 2004, selected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and also elected a fellow of the Association of the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. He has served or is serving on the editorial boards of numerous journals, including Science and various ACM and IEEE transactions. He has also served on numerous advisory boards, including DARPA's Executive Advisory Council on Advanced Logistics, and as an ad hoc member of the US Air Force Science Advisory Board. And he serves on a number of board of directors of the Development Gateway Foundation, and since Centimetrics, a startup, he is also on the Research Advisory Board of uh, Tata, Consultancy Research, Tata Consultancy Services, India's largest software firm, and on the Advisory Board of Cosmos ID, a firm specializing in bioinformatics. So over to Professor Vincent. Oh. Yes, <laughs> So thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And thanks also to Mr. Tarun Das for kindly organizing this session and for inviting me to be here. So it's a great honor to be here. And it's also, for me, a double privilege to come back to India after many years and give what has been the, I would say, second public talk I've ever given in India. The first was at CSI in Calcutta uh, about six weeks back. Uh, it's also a pleasure to be speaking in front of an audience that probably knows LET much better than I do. So there are many people who <laughs> study LET extensively in India for obvious reasons, and I'm sure they have access to a host of information that I don't have. So I would like to say that in all humility, because I always worry with such an audience that somebody will say my data is wrong, and therefore all the inferences are wrong, and the best defense I can offer to that is that even if my data is wrong or incomplete, it's the best I could do, number one. And second, I believe the techniques we have developed would be applicable to whatever data somebody else wants to apply to. So again, uh, as a professor at a university, I should say, I should highlight the with many others. Uh, the work was not done by me alone, but a team of graduate students, uh, researchers, and uh, other distinguished uh, scientists. So, Though Mr. Ramadurai talked extensively about my work on text analytics, I'm going to skip most of that today. So I won't talk about sentiment uh, at all. I'm going to talk about two studies we've done over the last couple of years, a few years, in fact, more than a couple of years. 
One, the Lost Tree Taiba study, which I'll spend a good hunk of the talk about. And second, how we might find weapons caches that support LED, uh, I, I'm sorry, IED attacks um, in pretty much any part of the world if you've got the data. All the work I'm talking about uses only open source information. At the University of Maryland, uh, I don't do any classified work. I don't hold any clearances. And uh, I publish everything I find. That's worth publishing. Um, not everything. Uh, so everything you, talk, you hear today is findable in the open literature, and in many cases, in much shorter form than in, this in the case of this particular book. So I'm, I'm going to start by moving away from LET and talking about big box retailers like Amazon, uh, eBay, et cetera. So I'm sure all of you have used services like this. And we started work on this LET project in early 2007. But prior to that, we'd studied Hezbollah, uh, Hamas as well. And the work was motivated by the very simple observation of how big box retailers did their business. Online retailers, of course. Um, so the idea is very simple. When you go to the website of a major uh, retailer, you issue a query. You're sitting at the desk at your computer, and you issue a query. This query goes to the website of the company in question. The company says, every time you ask a query, you are providing some information to the company about your interests, about what you care about, and what you're willing to click on, and what you're willing to pay for. So every time you click, there's a stream of queries that have preceded the query you currently asked that forms a context which guides the company in what to show you. So based on, so that there's a context in which a query is asked. For example, you may have typed uh, Sony camera, and then you later type Sony Cybershop camera. Or you may have typed Canon camera and Sony camera afterwards. So this gives you a context for the query. And on the basis of the specific query you're asking, the context of your query, as well as things you've done in the past, what you were shown and what you chose to act upon in different ways, the retailer builds a behavioral model of you. This is very specific. It's a, you know, the behavioral model of you might be different from the behavioral model built for Mr. Ramadurai, because you may have different interests you might have different attitudes to clicks. When you come and ask a new query, this behavioral model exists, and it's constantly updated as more and more transactions occur. And what the retailer says is, well, I want to show the user not just the answer to his specific query, but I want to show him a bunch of other things. And this bunch of other things are things that I hope this person will buy or click on so that the retailer generates revenue or hopes to generate revenue from it. So what he does is to say, I'm going to use the behavioral model when you come to issue a query and say, if I show this user this recommended product or this recommended product, here's the probability that this person will click on it. Using those forecasts of the probabilities, they then recommend certain products that you see as links in your Amazon search or your eBay search, things that they believe are related to your search. And then this is shown to you. That's sort of a very simple summary of how this work is executed. What we said is, can we apply this kind of cycle to behaviors not about individual consumers, but about groups, irrespective, or not just groups, but also processes? irrespective of whether it's a terrorist group, a set of institutional investors, or something else altogether. Can we sort of identify behaviors of entities? In the case of terrorist groups, LET, in this particular study, carries out various kinds of terror acts, so as opposed to queries that are terror acts uh, that we're looking at. And they carry out these terrorist acts under various conditions on the operating environment in which they're functioning. We don't know what those are, but that's what we hope to identify. So what we wanted to do was to learn a model that looked at the context surrounding the time when attacks of different types occurred, 
what LET actually did in those situations, or did not do for that matter, and then say, well, can we make forecasts of what they might do in a new or hypothetical situation, and what they might not do? And then on the basis of these forecasts, which of course are highly useful as well, can we then suggest what actions we might take as or uh, an, a, a counterterrorism organization might take in order to mitigate the risk that those harmful actions would in fact be taken. So in other words, if we understand the conditions under which LET carries out attacks, say, on uh, public sites or tourist sites, if we understand those conditions, then perhaps we can use our knowledge of those conditions to do something about it. We first proposed a model uh, about uh, more than six, seven years back, actually, called Stochastic Opponent Modeling Agents, which was a precursor of what was used in the LET study. And what I thought I would do is to show a little clip from a very popular TV show called The Number Show that used Soma and our work on Hezbollah to produce their show. They didn't actually tell us about it. Uh, and we found out more or less by accident, not because of the careful monitoring that Mr. Ramdurai credited us with. It just happened by accident. We found it. And I thought I'd show this quick clip because they do a much better job of explaining why you want to understand your adversary. I was wondering why a biotech company would be interested in the kidnapping. You think there's an underlying motive? Big corporation, government contracts, pull in DC. You know, we could put together a stochastic upon model agent. You could? Someone was designed by the Department of Defense to understand the motivations and assign probabilities to the actions of terrorist organizations like Hezbollah and Hamas. It's a lot like coaches studying game tape. Take soccer, for instance. A corner kick gives the attacking team a hefty advantage. They decide the initial variables of the play, when to kick it, where to kick it, how to curve the ball. Now, it's up to the opposing team's coaches to know these variables, to use them to predict the play for their defense. Will they bend the kick into the net? Punch it out to a rushing attacker for a head-on try. The team that studies their opponent will be more likely to stop the goal. That explains why every soccer match I ever watch ended 0-0. Zero, zero. <laughs> All right. So I'll go from there. That gives you a very quick idea of what we're trying to do. Understand the whole set of variables that may or may not have an impact on the behavior of LET. And then use the data to tell us what's going on. So to do this, we produced a set of about 770 variables. The variables fell into two categories. Variables defining different kinds of actions taken by LET, or for that matter, any other terrorist group. Everything I'm talking about applies not just to LET, but any terrorist group you might want to model, except for the specific behaviors of LET that we learned. And so we had two kinds of variables. Action variables describing their actions. And in our work, we only derived roles governing LET's behavior for some of those uh, actions that LET has taken over the years. And these are the actions. I'm not going to bore you all and discuss every single rule we discussed for every single one of these actions, but I'm going to give you a snapshot of a couple of actions and what these rules look like for them. Um, then there are environmental variables. Environmental variables describe all the action variables are actions carried out by LET. <coughs> environmental variables include also variables describing actions taken by other actors. So that could include Indian security or law enforcement. It could include the Pakistani military or Pakistani government. It could include other entities. Um, in addition, environmental variables include a set of other things. They include things like uh, arrests of LET personnel, uh, actions where LET personnel were killed one way or the other. Uh, they include things like uh, uh, belief systems, leadership structure, uh, economic uh, grievances or woes, political support of different types, etc. So most of the variables of the 770 are environmental variables. I'm going to show a little bit. What we try to do are derive rules. And the rules have the following form. It says, look, when I look at a particular action that LED is taking, in this example, I'm using attacks on Indian security installations as the uh, dependent variable or the action that I'm trying to learn behaviors for. And we're saying, find conditions on the environment which predict that within a few months, within K months, LET will take this action A with high probability 
but also with a bunch of other properties I'll talk about. So I want the condition to be such that when this condition is true, LET carries out the action with high probability. When this condition is false, it carries out the action with very low probability. The greater the spread between those two quantities, the more likely it is that you can use, you can look for this condition and say, oh, is it turned on or turned off? If it's turned on, you predict something's going to happen if it's turned within a few months. If it's turned off, you predict it's not going to happen. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the general idea. Of course, I could get 100% probabilities for everything with just one instance and say, oh, I saw this once. It was true. Therefore, it's true 100% of the times it was true. That doesn't do you any good whatsoever. So there are a bunch of other conditions that need to be satisfied as well. Okay? The conditions we're looking for should occur often enough, and there should be enough evidence to make sure that this rule is true. This is an example of a very simple rule, one of the rules we derived on attacks on Indian security installations. And here, the action we're trying to model is attacks by LET on security installations. Uh, we're saying, OK, we derived a rule which says that two months after months in which both these conditions were true, i.e., LET was waging a publicity campaign. This is something, a variable that we've defined quite precisely. I'm using it in a slightly sloppy way here. But uh, I don't want to go into the detail of exactly what we mean by waging a publicity campaign, because I mean, certainly uh, it's true that they're always unhappy uh, about uh, uh, India. And when their assets were not frozen by the Pakistani government, two months after these two conditions were both true, they tend to carry out attacks on Indian security installations. Now, let me say very clearly that correlation is not causation. Okay? <laughs> so this does not mean that this causes these attacks to occur. And in fact, there are many other circumstances we found that also cause, oh no, oops, that also <laughs> precede attacks on Indian security installations. So you can see how easy it is to make a mistake. So, so let me sort of, I'm going to look just at two types of actions today and talk about the rules we derived. And then I'm going to do a little retrospective on the Mumbai attacks, uh, largely because somebody asked me to do it, who was writing a book. And I worked it out for him, and then I figured I might as well use it in the presentation. So targeting civilians, this is a summary slide. And it basically says, look, when government actions are taken against LET, actions such as arrests, raids, bans, things like that, kills. LET tends to attack civilians a few months after such actions have occurred. And this is really interesting because the other action I'm going to talk about today are attacks on symbolic sites, tourist sites, transportation sites, which are slightly harder targets. Okay? So this action, or this class of action, Traditional law enforcement actions against LET seem to be related, seem to be followed by an uptick in attacks on civilians a couple of months later. However, these actions are followed also by a downtick, as you will see in a few slides from now, by a downtick in attacks on harder targets. So what this means is that these have uh, you know, they're a mixed bag, okay? Uh, they're good for some things, but effectively cause harder targets to be left alone by LET in favor of softer targets. Oops. Another variable that consistently came up over and over again in our study was the internal cohesion of LET. So those who've studied LET knows that it's split only once. And even there, there's considerable uh, debate in the literature. I'd like to actually uh, say a word about prior work before ours by Stephen Pankel at American University, who wrote a, was an extremely courageous uh, fellow who spent uh, lots of time in Pakistan interviewing all kinds of people and provided a lot of source material for our work. And also Wilson John uh, from Delhi, who also wrote an excellent book. We got a copy of the book only couple of weeks before our book was being wrapped up. So we had to read it very quickly and figure out how to relate it to ours. But they were both two very predecessor books, both excellent. So internal cohesion of LET. LET, though it's not split more than once, there have been signs of internal dissension periodically. And whenever LET is internally cohesive, which is a term I'm using for now 
to say no dissension or worse. They have carried out lots of different types of attacks, including attacks on civilians. Let me give you an example. These are just examples of some of the rules we present in the book. Uh, targeting civilians, examples of these attacks include attacks on pilgrims going to the Amarnath Shrine uh, in 2002, uh, attacks on the eve of President Clinton's visit in March 2000, in which uh, a number of Sikhs were assassinated or killed, etc. And here are examples of some of these rules. And I'm going to come back to some of these rules later. So this rule says, two months after LET makes territorial claims in the press, Notice that this is different from saying they, may, they have territorial claims in their head, okay? which may be true always. It just says, we noticed that they were making territorial claims in the press. Two months after they made these territorial claims in the press, and they carried out attack, oh, I'm sorry, and a number of LET personnel were arrested, there's a 90% likelihood that they're going to carry out one to nine attacks on Hindus. In other words, Hindus are specifically targeted. Um, Another rule says two months after months in which LET was not splitting and one LET member was arrested, the group is basically almost guaranteed to carry out some attacks against civilians. So these are two, you know, so when you look at these rules, it's not that easy to discover them in a, so in a database on your own. You can certainly validate them in, in the database on your own, but it's not that easy to discover them because this data set, think of an Excel spreadsheet with 707 variables. 770 costs. It's not easy to see them. And these are variables which involve two preconditions here uh, in the if part, along with values associated with those preconditions, making it computationally a challenge. Um, let's look at attacks on public sites. And when I say public sites, I'm talking about public tourist and uh, transportation sites. The Mumbai attacks of 2008 are uh, an example of this. And here, we observed what I said earlier, which is that government actions of traditional law enforcement variety against LET are, in fact, quite effective. Or, well, let me rephrase that. I don't want to say they're effective. They seem to be followed by a downturn in attacks on these harder targets. Um, deaths of LET leaders, which may be because of such actions, also seem to be followed by a downturn in such attacks. But internal cohesion is related to these attacks, and uh, there are other variables also related, related to these attacks. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, and then I'm going to sort of take these back and tie them to the Mumbai attacks retrospectively. So this rule says three months after months in which LET was not splitting. So it was basically almost a guarantee that you could expect attacks on one of these types of sites either public sites, or symbolic sites, or tourist sites, or transportation sites. And the other one says, two months after LET had bases on the Indian border, and a certain number of LET leaders died, uh, when, I, when we say died, we don't necessarily mean a natural death, uh, then this is a very interesting rule. This rule says they're not likely to carry out such attacks on these targets. OK, so let's go look at the Mumbai attacks. I have several rules explaining what happened in Mumbai in 2008, of which I'm just showing two. But one of the rules says there are 0 to 29 deaths when LET was not splitting. I think it's one of the rules I just showed on the previous slide. Uh, here we go. And there were no splits three months before the November 2008 Mumbai attack. So if you looked at August 2008, no splits going on, no signs of internal dissension within LET. If there were, they were carefully hidden from the open source literature, which is what we looked at. So using just that rule alone, you might be tempted to predict that no attacks, I'm sorry, that attacks would occur in November 2008 on the basis of this. I'm usually reluctant to actually make a prediction on the basis of one rule. Uh, and the reason is I know that all these rules also have some probability of being wrong, OK? Uh, which you know is true of everything. And all predictions have, even if your rules are 100% accurate, or you think they're 100% accurate, they could still change their behavior. Um, and so your prediction can be wrong. So generally, when we made predictions, we looked for multiple signals. Another signal here in this case, and we had more, said LET carries out no attacks on such sites two months after months in which they had cross-border camps, which they did uh, a couple of months before uh, these attacks. 
and a certain number of LEP commanders were killed. In this case, this, these two preconditions, so this is a, remember that this is a rule telling you conditions under which they do not carry out such attacks. But the precondition of this rule was not true because in September 2008, actually, we counted at least five LEP commanders who were killed. Uh, so we presume that there were at least five, assuming we didn't know about some. Irrespective of that, this precondition was false, right? Now, I told you earlier that for the action associated with the rule, in this case, LET carrying out no attacks of, on such sites, when the precondition is false, the probability that this action is true is very low, right? I was looking for preconditions such that when they're true, the post condition is true with high probability. When it's false, it's true with low probability. So in this case, the action of LET carrying out no attacks is true with low probability, which really means they're going to carry out attacks with high probability. All right? So that then allows you also provide some further support to the inferences you can draw from this rule, allowing you, along with some other rules, to infer that they would not, um, they would have attacked um, such sites. And we also had some rules like this on attacks on civilians, not just on public. Uh, symbolic and transportation sites. Uh, I'm sorry to say we did not have these rules when the attacks occurred. So this is a uh, post facto analysis, not uh, prior to the fact. I'm going to say a little bit about policy computation. In our book, we present a set of 61 rules. And policies, think about it this way. If I look at all the rules that predict attacks, not the no attack, but predict attacks, what I ideally want to do is to make the precondition at least one precondition of each of those rules false, right? Because the way I've derived the rules, I know that if the precondition is false, the probability that the post condition of the rule, the action associated with the rule, is going to occur is very low. So if I can make all these preconditions false, then I've got a shot of reducing all these attacks. Now, of course, I can't randomly make preconditions false, okay? Because some of our preconditions involve LET's belief system, uh, the al Hadith. Uh, belief system. We didn't think they were going to give it up. Uh, we didn't think there was any credible way to make them stop claiming territory. So he said, well, there are certain variables that cannot be altered. So subject to the restriction that these variables cannot be altered, what can we do about the other variables? So think of all the other variables as policy levers. And you're trying to figure out how to reset them. So you've got a lever here, and you're saying, I can move this lever, so where do I set it? I can move this letter, lever, where do I set it? And so forth. <coughs> So here, well, the bad news is we couldn't find a policy. We could show theoretically that there was no policy that allowed us to get everything right. But we said, well, if you drop a tax on holidays and are satisfied with the rest, what do we get? So we had a class of uh, actions corresponding to a tax on holidays. We found a total of four policies. And what was very interesting is all these policies involved a total of about 15 do's and don'ts. So doing certain things and not doing certain things were both valuable. Uh, and these, in this slide, I've just covered what was common across all these policies. So you can see that the big one here, these two variables are really one variable for all practical purposes, which says, you know, promote internal dissension within LET. Uh, one of the best known examples of a terrorist group that was defanged uh, by promoting internal dissension was the uh, Abu Nidal organization. <coughs> which uh, many of you uh, undoubtedly remember, uh, carried out a number of terrorist attacks, um, in, uh, including the Vienna airport attack, the Achilles Loro attack, etc. cetera. Um, and they were defanged, uh, according to published reports, by spreading paranoia in the mind of Abu Nidal. So even though I haven't seen evidence that his lieutenants were uh, bad guys, I'm sorry, were unfaithful to him, they were certainly bad guys, but I had seen no evidence that they were unfaithful to him. A campaign that tried to paint them as unfaithful to him succeeded in stoking paranoia, and he managed to get rid of them and effectively partly helped destroy his own organization. Uh, we also found things that pretty much any counterterrorism expert or international affairs expert with any interest in the South Asia region would tell you should fall out, which is to somehow deal with the Pakistani military and disrupt support they provide to LED. Um, 
So it was good to see some common sense things fall out, but all this came directly out of uh, the algorithms we developed. Which, by the way, uh, again, I want to emphasize these algorithms have been around for a while in the literature. Uh, we just applied them. Um, in some cases, we in most of the cases, we had developed the algorithm for something else many years earlier. So the algorithm to learn the behavioral rules were patented by us in a filing before we started this work uh, and awarded much later and were intended for something else altogether. Uh, but since then, we've used it for all kinds of strange things. Uh, LET's communications campaign came up repeatedly as well. And here, even though we say disrupt LET's communications campaign, sometimes the communications campaign is actually an indicator of bad things to come. So perhaps you don't want to disrupt it, but let them ramp it up so you know what's going to happen. Um, you want to disrupt arrests of LET personnel and their training camps. Again, some common sense things like disrupting training camps. But at the same time, there are certain actions that all policies said are not effective as strategic instruments. I'm going to be very careful about how I say this. So we're not saying, so what this says is, don't sort of spend a lot of time looking at specific raids on LET targets, specific arrest campaigns, et cetera. This might be a horrifying thing to say to law enforcement experts. But we're not by any means saying, you know, if you see a guy carrying a gun, don't arrest him or shoot him or stop him. What we're saying is, as a strategic instrument, they have not had the desired effect. And the reason they've not had the desired effect is these preconditions, when these actions are taken, they switch from hard targets to soft targets, much harder to protect soft targets. There are also some other uh, variables. Again, some of these variables, you actually, and these are the differences between the four policies. So you can see that the four policies, P1 through P4 we generated, agreed on a huge number of things. All these things here. And they only disagreed on a very small number of things, including some pretty strange things, uh, like reducing the publicity generated by high-profile trials of LET personnel. Okay, So the, the sort of example that came to mind was a high-profile trial in Australia of Fahim Lodi, uh, a pediatrician, Pakistani pediatrician, who had trained in LET camps and was planning to carry out an attack on the Australian power grid. Okay? That was a high-profile trial, and for various reasons, it seemed to be followed by various kinds of attacks. Uh, in addition, disrupting LET social services and medical programs, like other terrorist groups like Hezbollah, LET has a very, very active social services program intended to fill gaps in basic services which are not very well provided, to the best of my knowledge, by the Pakistani state. Okay? So effectively, when there's a vacuum, they're able to come in and say, we're the good guys. We're going to fill in uh, these needs of common people. And in this way, they embed themselves in the fabric of Pakistani society, making them harder to deal with. I'm going to switch from LET very quickly. I know I, I'm running out of time. To talking about helping reduce IED attacks, and then I'm going to stop. So very quickly, this is a map of Baghdad. And again, this was uh, work uh, primarily done by my student, Paolo Shakarian. Um, and here, and again, all with open source information. And this is a map of Baghdad. And we had data from open sources, 21 months of data on locations of IED attacks, as well as locations where caches were found. Uh, from this data, we were a from parts of this data anyway, we were able to learn two numbers, which I call alpha and beta. Again, this is well known to criminologists uh, who used to look at things like burglaries and say, well, you know, people committing certain kinds of crimes, if they commit the crime here, they live not too close to the place where they're committing the crime, so they don't try, you know, commit the crime in the next, you know, two, two houses away. They commit it a certain distance away, so you've got the crime occurring here and a certain radius. And they don't typically commit crimes within the circle corresponding to that radius. And that's the lower bound alpha. But on the other hand, they don't commit, want to travel huge distances to commit these crimes either. So there's an upper bound beta. Okay? You can learn these two numbers, alpha and beta, from historical data using very, very simple uh, algorithms to learn this. Okay? But in addition, we had something called a feasibility predicate. A feasibility predicate basically says, look, you know, these are zones you can draw on a map. If you use something like Google Maps, which is what we use, you can draw polygons on a map and say, these polygons, we don't believe, for whatever reason, uh, that 
the caches supporting IED attacks are going to be there. In the case of attacks in Baghdad that we looked at, all the attacks we looked at were Shiite-backed attacks, um, uh, or believed to be Shiite-backed attacks. And so because of the sectarian conflict, we did not believe that Sunni neighborhoods would be hosting the cache. So this is a map of Baghdad again, showing <coughs> bodies of water, Sunni neighborhoods, where, which are assumed not to host the cache, and in green, uh, coalition bases where, uh, again, you know, you're not expecting an IED attack, uh, IED cache in the middle of a base full of uh, U.S., British, and all the soldiers. So now, here's what happens. If I draw a simplified picture and say attacks are shown, locations of attacks are shown in red, I'm sorry, this is a bug in my PowerPoint preparation. Uh, what you're doing is you can see around each red dot, you've got a donut-shaped region around it. Okay, And the alpha and beta tell you with high probability that there's a cache somewhere in that donut. Okay? In addition, however, the feasibility predicate tells you parts of that donut are chopped off or eaten up. Okay? So what you've now got are a bunch of irregular regions where parts of the, you've got a whole bunch of donuts intersecting in various places and parts being, irregular parts being eaten up. Okay? I won't tell you how we solve this. But uh, we came up with an algorithm to do this and to figure out where within these donuts it would make the most sense for them to put their caches and uh, described in a set of papers. And then we built a system called SCARE, which automatically generated potential locations where the caches might be. Okay? On data in Baghdad, we were able to predict the locations of the caches to within 700 meters of their actual location. Uh, in Baghdad, that's still a lot of territory. But think of a circle of radius 700. I predict here, the cache is here. I'm basically drawing a circle of 700 meter radius around it and saying it's somewhere in there. It's a densely packed city, so there's still a lot of work to be done. Again, I want to make it very clear. Everything we're saying is just to help reduce, not to eliminate. Okay? Uh, we don't know how to do that. And there are plenty of things we don't know. By the time we finish both these studies, there were so many questions we wish we knew the answers to, uh, but we felt we could do a little better. Here's an example of a typical kind of uh, output, which says, well, look, we predicted caches, and we found so many caches within 500 meters of our predictions, so many caches between 500 and 1,000 meters, and so forth. Okay? I'm going to stop there, uh, because I know I'm running out of time, and say, well, look, uh, my conclusion is we want to look very, very closely at data. And rather than positing a hypothesis and saying, here's a hypothesis, I'm going to verify it, the problem with that, which is a traditional scientific way of an inquiry, which I don't want to question since the time of Newton and Euclid, the problem with that is I might notice correlations, but there may be other correlations that also explain what I'm seeing. If I just focus on one, I'm missing out on many other things that might also be alternative explanations. When we make decisions, we want the whole set of possible explanations so that analysts, human experts, policymakers have the full uh, spectrum of options available to them. All our methods use intensive human input. Um, example, the feasibility definition, the constraints on policies, what's doable, what's not, etc. And the results, likewise, need to be scrutinized carefully. In our case, in our book on LET, a number of people who are non-computer scientists who, who co-authored the study with us. And, and in particular, I want to mention my uh, good friend and colleague, Aaron Manis, who previously wrote a book on terrorist groups, uh, without me. Um, a very good book. And effectively, you can always find errors. You know, computers are not infallible. Uh, they make mistakes. There are mistakes in the way the data is entered, which sometimes can mess things up. There are errors in the software itself. Uh, all kinds of things can go wrong. So I want to make it clear that whatever these computers come up with, I, as a computer scientist, am telling you, please distrust them. Treat them with a healthy dose of skepticism, and then make up your own mind. OK, so I think that's my story here today. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Vies. I'll just uh, 
I will ask you a few questions based on my understanding and then throw it open to the audience. Now, when you talked about your work on LET, you said the results are all based on open source information. <coughs> then for it to make a useful <coughs> conclusion or actions in a real operational sense, one has to implement on data owned by the security agencies. Would Indian IT firms and security organizations be capable of implementing such methods? What's your view? Uh, so, I think Indian IT, first, you know, it would be a little awkward for me to sit next to Mr. Ramdurai and answer no to that question. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, uh, I think there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that a lot of Indian IT firms understand the kinds of data mining we do very well indeed. Okay? It's being used for a lot of things ranging from detection of fraud in stock markets to detection of uh, potential places where there might be uh, mineral resources, etc. So when you're looking for mineral resources, you want to identify terrain features and measurements that separate out places which are likely to have the kind of resource you're looking for versus places that do not have it. You're looking for the same kind of role, probably without the time factor uh, I showed in my roles. Um, you are, uh, likewise, there are other, so there are plenty of applications. Uh, credit card fraud is another example where IT firms like uh, TCS, Infosys, and others have worked on, where they look for transactions and say, can I find conditions on the profiles of people and their spending patterns and their charges that distinguish fraudulent transactions from, or people whose credit cards appear to have been compromised from those that are not. So there are plenty of applications like this. Indian firms have built pretty stable solutions for these kinds of things um, you know, in many, many different domains. I'd like to add that in addition, um, you know, university builds software. You know, I hate to criticize my own software, but we don't build software that works 24-7, uh, 365 days. We provide no support. And very few computer science students and faculty actually document their software in a way that's necessary for commercial use. So I would say that the core contributions we've made are our algorithms that we've developed, uh, the use of those algorithms for these kinds of applications. Uh, the software itself, I think even ours, would be significantly improved by, you know, and possibly uh, you, I mean, built. I mean, I wouldn't use our software in an operational setting. Uh, I would use the findings to inform behaviors, and somebody else should, can probably implement the code in a much more stable way than we did. Um, Indian security agencies, um, I uh, am hardly an expert on them, but uh, the few people I've met from there have struck me as extremely dedicated and very, very smart. Uh, and so I suspect uh, they can probably do it without much difficulty. So thank um, you. And I'd also say that, you know, I do want to note that since November 2008, we haven't seen significant attacks. Um, there have been some low-level attacks. We haven't seen significant large attacks. I don't know whether to attribute it to the vigilance of the security services or not, but it's a good sign. Mm -hmm. So, Kenny, you explained uh, about the Mumbai 2008 attacks based on the models. Now, can you also say a bit about what LET might do <laughs> in the future? Um, well, so it does happen. I have slides for this um, because I've been asked this question before, so I'm usually prepared for it. Uh, I do want to just make one prediction for the immediate future, which is based on some of the rules we have, I don't believe there will be a big attack in the first quarter of 2013, but there probably will be some low-level attacks on civilians. Uh, and on this one, I sure hope I'm not wrong. So, uh, but I could be. Um, the rules are not infallible, and our predictions are not either. But I think the first quarter of 2013, I feel pretty good that there won't be big attacks. <coughs> but there probably will be some low-level ones. How do you know LET will not try to discredit you by doing the opposite of what you just said in response to the previous question? Um, well, I think the... Well, 
if they were to discredit me by not performing the attacks, I think that would be a good thing. Good thing. Um, <laughs> and in fact, I might even claim success by saying it's my roles that prompted security services to act and stop those, uh, though I'm not going to do that. So I would love to be proved wrong in terms of non-occurrence of attacks that I predict might happen. That would be great. And uh, whether they're because of anything I said or not uh, is uh, irrelevant. You know, it would be great if those attacks were to go down. The second thing, though, is um, I simply don't think I'm sufficiently important for the government of Pakistan or LET to care a whole lot. Uh, so I'm relying on uh, you know, relative unimportance as an individual. Um, if the Indian government was to come out and make some policy statement, that might have some greater impact. If I'm going to say it, you know, people are going to say some wacko American academic, uh, you know, it's fine. So. No, but then uh, it's extremely useful when you talked about your techniques that can be applied in many other business and government domains. It would be great if you can say a little bit about similar applications you have built as far as the applications you think that this technology can be suited for. What are the kind of companies in India that could use such techniques? Um, so we have built um, an application uh, which looks at uh, data from the World Bank, UNESCO, UNICEF, a number of um, about 200 plus countries. We look at uh, over 4,000 variables and we're trying to predict or understand how to influence educational outcomes in those countries. Primarily uh, things like uh, female uh, pre-primary enrollments, uh, and in fact not just for female children, but also for male children. Um, we are looking at, so those are some of the dependent variables. Uh, enrollments are correlated heavily according to uh, classical studies in education done by development organization, just enrollment at the pre-primary level, are correlated with increased GDP of the country in the future, many years down the road, um, et cetera. So we're looking at that. In addition, uh, I mean, my favorite uh, application is one which I'm doing right now with the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. Gorilla as in the ape, uh, you know, the big mm -hmm. uh, ape. And here, we're trying to understand conditions that govern the behavior of groups of gorillas. So gorillas live in families or groups of anywhere from six or seven gorillas to uh, 30, 40 gorillas. They live on the border of the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Uganda, and uh, Rwanda, uh, at least the so-called mountain gorillas. And we're looking to understand the behavior. I mean, examples of behaviors are when does a gorilla group split, OK? By the way, um, so. Gorilla groups split periodically because uh, there's internal squabbling. And this is not unlike uh, the other kind of gorilla groups uh, as well. <laughs> so that's something we're looking at too. Um, and all this work got started many years back when uh, our data mining algorithm got started many years ago when we were talking to a manufacturing company, a large electronics company, which came to us and said, hey, listen, uh, we measure all kinds of things when a product goes from the raw material stage to the finished product stage. So there's a production line, the raw materials fed into the, at various points in the production line, and the company was measuring all kinds of things in the process. And they were interested in learning conditions that separated out the products that fell off the production line at the end that were defective from those that were OK. Uh, it's the same thing. You have a bunch of measurements corresponding to not the 770 independent variables, but some other variables. And of course, what you measured depended on the product. And we were trying to figure out what conditions separated them out, separated out the good ones from the defective ones. So we can see a number of applications for this kind of thing. Uh, but I just want to emphasize that uh, there are also domains where we've tried to apply it, where we were uh, spectacularly unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have not sort of identified exactly why uh, it was frustrating. And if we'd identified precisely why, we might have had a better handle on how to fix the algorithm. But basically, one of my hypotheses is there was nothing good to find. So we didn't find anything good. And um, that could be because the data was, there was no discernible pattern to be found. 
But I can't guarantee that either. So it could be errors in our algorithm as well. Great to know. So many areas here applied or potential applications. Let me throw open to the floor for any questions. We'll take for the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Please. Yeah, Professor, uh, my name is Arvind Gupta. My name is Arvind Gupta. I work in the area of analytics only. I, have, I do developmental analytics for a political party in India. My, I have two questions to you. Uh, does your uh, study and uh, all this uh, work that you've done take into account social uh, data, social networks data, or is it primarily uh, news and uh, other, other data like that? Data like that? So uh, I threw in one slide on it, but I didn't show it. So I, uh, you've given me an opportunity. To do that. that I did. Uh, and and uh, if I can ask my second question, and you can choose to answer it whenever. Uh, how how long does it take, or how much uh, uh, data you need to develop a new model? So let's say to predict uh, possible riots in India, uh, situations like okay. that. Okay. So, so this is a very good question, and I'll I can't talk about riots in India, but I can talk about riots in the Sudan. Okay. Um, so I'll start with the last part of the question first. So there's some ongoing work I have uh, with a company which looks at being able to predict a number of dependent variables, such as riots, uh, as well as battles that have been won by a government, not lost by the government, et cetera. And so there, um, we had data on an annual basis. Uh, we tracked a number of sentiment-related variables. Uh, supportive of pro-government figures, as well as supportive of insurgent uh, groups and leaders. And on the basis of those, we were able to actually predict um, riots during certain months with a uh, high, high degree of accuracy, over 80% accuracy. We were not able to predict, nor did we seek to predict where those riots would occur, except that they would occur in that case in the Sudan. Uh, those results are still very much ongoing. I don't uh, want to claim those as being rock solid results yet, so, but they are in the works. In terms of social media, in the studies I talked about, all the data was derived from as reliable news sources as we could get. We have uh, several studies, in fact, one of which is not on the slides. One study which we have ongoing right now, I've been meaning to finish it forever, but uh, haven't been able to get around to it, is looking at how terrorist groups use YouTube by automatically analyzing not the video stream, which is too difficult to analyze automatically, but the textual comments surrounding them. So we have some work on that. And uh, we're looking at approximately, if I remember right, 56 terrorist groups. And we chose as the subjects of that study every single group that was listed by any one of about 10 countries that we considered respectable. Um, the US, Canada, India, Israel, UK, Germany, etc. You know, the usual. Um, so. We've also done a lot of work on social media analytics, but we have been trying to look at how to analyze, how to predict diffusion patterns on a topic-specific basis. So in other words, uh, you mentioned you work for a political party. Uh, we do not. Um, but we can predict, for example, the expected number of positive opinions expressed on a particular entity or a product uh, pretty accurately. Um, but um, um, yeah, so, but in the studies that I reference, we're not looking at social media data. We have active work going on looking at Twitter and other kinds of data, but not for this, but for Thank other contexts, like product diffusion mm -hmm. and things like that. So. That's brilliant. Uh, you know, the, the proof of the pudding is in its eating, and terrorist attack may or may not come about, you know, you said so. Uh, does your model on simpler aspects of day-to-day -day matters of security, let's talk of, say, uh, uh, traffic accidents or, say, uh, instances of robbery or theft or what has gathered the attention of India right now, rapes. Now, wouldn't, because these are things which are occurring da daily and therefore they would have a predictable pattern. Have say, some modeling been done in this regard uh, by you or by somebody else? Because the advantage of having such a modeling, it will be easier for the security agencies to comprehend. And thereafter, you can build faith in anything else. Yeah. So um, in the case of our IED attacks, 
you know, I think we were able to validate it pretty uh, credibly. Uh, there is work um, out of UCLA uh, by a criminologist. Uh, I'm desperately trying to remember his name. It'll come, probably come back to me as soon as this talk is over. Um, who did do work on analyzing locations of drug criminals uh, in LA street gangs uh, and LA, you know, drug trafficking circles. Um, so that's pretty nice work. Um, there is um, work also on predicting the spread of diseases uh, based on causes that are environmentally related, which also, uh, the models are somewhat different from the ones I showed, but yeah. So there is work on these things. Uh, but again, you know, you have to use a mix of the algorithm, the software, and common sense. And uh, sometimes computer scientists, including me, you know, forget the last part uh, when we get very excited about the results. And then somebody has to pull us back and say, okay, you know, is this really right? Yeah. And so that's why we need a constant dialogue. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, I'm Ramanujam, an academician. Uh, when you predict the possible targets of attack by terrorists, can your work also throw some light on the anti-terrorist or counter-terrorism attacks and see the correlation of uh, damages done to civilians. One is from the terrorist groups, the other is by the governments, by military action. And then the other one is very, very civil. For example, Anna Hazare's movement and recently the outpouring, spontaneous outpouring against the innocent girls, rape and subsequent tragedy. Now, the security agencies, they were not actually in a, in a position even to predict the swelling of the uh, mass protests who are all unarmed civilians and how prepared they were. Repeatedly, they were unprepared. How this study can uh, give some kind of clues to the security agencies? Well, I'd like to uh, first, you know, I want to, anybody, uh, unless they have very, very explicit intelligence telling them about it. And I would not fault uh, any security agency for inability to predict, I mean, prevent very, very specific kinds of attacks. Uh, I also remember that after the 26-11 attacks mm -hmm. in Mumbai, um, there were a bunch of guys who came out of the woodwork saying, you know, we had warned India that this was going to happen. What they omitted to say is how many times they'd warned India of similar attacks before, which turned out to be false. So I would really like to know the answer to that uh, before I you know, give any credence to these claims. So um, I think it's very, I mean, I have not studied uh, the specific instances of, uh, that you referred to, so I can't really comment on them. But I do want to caution that you know, predicting individual events I haven't seen anybody do a good job of it so far, and I certainly don't want to claim we can. After him, I'll come back to this. Subhaya here. Um, so is it possible, I mean, with the vagaries of monsoons and the weather conditions, which uh, uh, in this country we are having problems in terms of predicting the monsoons and therefore the food production and food security, um, I'm sure this then should be a fairly simple <laughs> kind of a, I think, uh, for people like you, you know, because I think that would be make a big difference. So uh, that's a great question, and I'm sorry to disappoint you. Uh, I was at a talk given by a bunch of NASA weather prediction guys who spent their whole lives building models of weather uh, uh, patterns, which are completely different from anything I've ever envisaged. The mathematics of the models is totally different. And, uh, you know, I would say that if I could predict these kinds of attacks with the same, I mean, I know everybody, it's, you know, everybody loves to complain about weather predictions and weather forecasts. The truth of the matter is, as far as I can tell, they've done a pretty good job, okay? I would be very happy if we could predict terrorist attacks with anything remotely resembling the accuracy with which they have predicted the weather. Um, so that's where I think we are. <laughs> so, 
Uh, what about uh, predicting natural disasters like volcanoes, hurricanes, typhoons, cyclone Sandy, etc.? Uh, same response. I have not attended a talk on predicting volcanic activity or cyclones, earthquakes. earthquakes. I haven't attended talks on any of those prediction types. But the little I know about those domains is also they have completely different types of mathematics used for those predictions. And uh, to be honest, uh, I don't understand the math. Uh, it's a different kind of math that I, that I know. And uh, uh, in the, the case of earthquakes and tsunamis, I can't speak to the accuracy because I don't listen to those forecasts on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, I don't know. So. Yeah. But is it, is, is it possible to predict them? I do not know. So I would only say yes if I had actually seen somebody predict it accurately or if I was doing it myself. So it has uh, to get me right. No, no, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying I don't know. He doesn't know. Yeah. Sorry. Very good evening, sir. I have two questions for you. One, 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 please. Others are there. <laughs> Uh, whatever your inputs are there, uh, I am sure various governments, you know, USA, India must take action on that. So have you ever felt, ki, are you in the line of fire against these uh, terrorist groups? Uh, I certainly know my wife feels that way. Um, and uh, as long as she's concerned about it, I'm actually quite happy. It, uh, so, um, so the only time I think... Uh, this came up was when we wrote our paper on Hezbollah, which um, you know we published in an academic conference. We didn't expect anybody to pay the slightest attention to it. And this time, one of our bots that was monitoring uh, internet activity flagged it one day and sent me an email. So I looked at the article, and it was an article in the Beirut Daily Star. The article was, our paper appeared in, I think, April 2008, maybe. And the article appeared in approximately October, November of that year. And the article was written by a journalist who basically mocked us quite uh, mercilessly. Um, and he said, well, if these American academics are right, then Israel's generals can uh, rest easy in the first half of 2009 because uh, there are Lebanese elections going on. These guys have some correlation between Lebanese elections and non-attacks by uh, Hezbollah on Israel at that time. And then he spoke to an academic in Lebanon who said, no, no, this is all wrong. Uh, Hezbollah issued a comment. He called up his local Hezbollah contacts. And they issued a comment saying, we've studied the work quite closely. I assume that if they had not seen it before, they did as soon as they were called. And uh, they issued a fairly you know, rational comment. And that's the only evidence we have that uh, a terrorist group has actually paid attention to what we've done. Hello. Uh, good evening. Uh, I must congratulate upon, uh, you upon the information that you shared with us. It's amazing. Uh, with more information being generated in the future and with more computational power available, I'm certain it will be gaining more ground in the future. Now, my question to you is, there are obvious advantages and disadvantages of uh, throwing a research like this open to public. Uh, <laughs> advantage being uh, there would be more contribution and disadvantage obviously being uh, we, we spoke about 770 variables. Now, these groups are, in fact, in a situation of manipulating many of those variables, or at least project those variables in a way which, which could affect our understanding and hence the analysis. So how real do you think is this risk of putting something like this in the public domain? Is it real enough? Will it be real enough sometime down the line? And if yes, how do we plan to manage that? So uh, this is an excellent question. and. Uh even though it's not the first time I've been asked the question, I don't think my answer has improved. Um, so I think uh, there are several things I could say about it. First, um, we have not actually published our data. Uh, the algorithms are a different story. All the algorithms are out there. And in fact, if you don't use our algorithm, there are several other algorithms which I think would do just as good a job at uh, making the predictions that we make. So I don't want to take credit for the algorithms entirely. Uh, the community in data mining has done a fabulous job in developing algorithms that could be used with perhaps slightly different results than the ones we've found. Um, it's only when you have the data that you know what the algorithms are going to predict. 
Um, in some sense, um, we are also almost 100% sure that the data that virtually any security agency has on LET or any other group is going to be different from what we have. So part of our work on the rules has included some sensitivity testing. Uh, but it's possible that if that data differs dramatically from ours, the conclusions we draw are, in fact, incorrect. Okay? So we just don't know. And I suspect they don't know either. So, Kamlesh. Uh, I'm Kamlesh Pajaj from uh, DSCI. You talked about your prediction for the first quarter of 2013, and uh, also that the model does uh, come up with some kind of a prediction for the November 2008 uh, attacks on India. So based on certain uh, policy parameters and others that you must have built into the model. Have you tried to validate that for the period 2008 to 2012 during these four years, whether your model predicted any such uh, kind of attacks and whether they actually happened? Yes. So all our, so what we do are what are called split sample validations, where what we do is, I don't remember if we did it on 2008 to 2012, but for LET, we had data on a monthly basis on all 770 variables from the beginning of 1990 to the end of 2010, of which I think is a good point. I forgot to mention that my data for LET largely ends in 2010 when we finished the systematic collection. Um, nonetheless, we collected enough data to just make the prediction I did. Um, the, with, um, so the way we do split sample validation is we take the data and say we're taking the first n months of the data we've got. We're going to learn the model from those first n months and then predict for the next few months. Oh. And by changing the sample we use to learn and the sample we, and once we've learned on this sample, we always predict for the next few months. We never made any predictions more than three months out. So we're not predicting, so that's another good point. We're not making long-term predictive trends. Uh, we don't feel comfortable doing that. Short term, we feel a little more comfortable. Uh, and so most of our predictions have been, you know, three months. If somebody were to really, you know, push me hard, I would go to five months. But I won't predict anything more than five months because I don't have rules for anything beyond five months. I do have rules up to five months. Uh, in the book, we only looked at rules up to three months. Thank you. Um, hello, sir. Uh, my name is Shaila. I'm representing the Internet Democracy Project. And my question is a little mathematical. Uh, out of the 700 of so variables, uh, does any, any variable map intergovernmental or diplomatic level talks uh, between India and Pakistan? And if yes, uh, is there any correlation, I mean, one word to draw a correlation between uh, terrorist attack, LED attacks, let's say, and uh, diplomatic level or intergovernmental level talks? What would that mark? Uh, so yes, we do have variables uh, relating to uh, diplomatic relationships being entertained between basically a warming of diplomatic relations between India and Pakistan. Uh, in the case of LET, uh, we did not find any rules involving that. Uh, however, let me um, um, add a couple of caveats to that. Um, however, in the case of IM, uh, Indian Mujahideen, we did. And IM, of course, is uh, very closely related to LET. Um, we did not think about this till we started doing the work on IM which is an ongoing project. Um, what we realized was when we did our work on LET, remember I talked about the fact that for a rule to be considered good, in addition to the probabilities, the rules have to be true often enough. You know, a one-off doesn't work. We set, that's called support of the rule. We set the support threshold for our work on LET at a certain level. When we, and the reason was we had 21 years of data on LET. In contrast, IM has been around for a much shorter period of time. So we set the support threshold lower. What we don't know in our current study is whether the latter, this variational thresholding, is what caused us to discover rules relating to uh, diplomatic warmth of warming of diplomatic relations, or whether it was something else. Okay? So there is something going on there. But I think my answer is I don't know for sure. Well, the reason is um, in the case in the case of IM, I think I have a pretty good trend. But I don't. I'm not unable to say that that trend was not present in the LET data. 
And the reason I'm not able to say that is I never generated rules with the support thresholds below the threshold we set. So I'd have to go back and redo that. It's not a problem to redo it. It's just, you know, one more thing to do. In the case of IM, uh, warming of diplomatic relations seem to be preceding various kinds of attacks by a few months. Yeah. One, two, and the last one. Professor so Subramanian, uh, I liked your slide on the IEDs and, you know, how do you reduce them. Now, uh, my name is Subhimal Bharajarji. I've headed General Dynamics in India. And we have dealt with mines. In fact, 40,000 miles of uh, our light armor vehicle striker is done in Iraq. Now, what we did in terms of technology was from a flat uh, hull, we went to double V, and that was our way of reducing. Do you see whatever uh, studies you have done and any of the sensor companies or the sensor research that's happening, you know, actually able to pick up uh, the patterns or predictions that you are trying to study? Thank you. Um, I do know that there are a large variety of approaches that have been used to help IED interdiction. And uh, many of them are very complementary to what we do. I mean, there's everything from avoidance. We've done a very, very small piece of the overall puzzle, which is just trying to detect where the caches are, not trying to detect how to avoid uh, you know, um, roadside bombs that have been pre-positioned by um, an insurgent group. We've not done that. Um, so there's a large part of the landscape uh, involving IEDs that we've not covered. And certainly there are a lot of sensor-based approaches that I've heard about. I have not studied them in detail. But I think what I've heard about them shows considerable value. Uh, <laughs> hello, sir. Good evening. I'm Dr. Sanjeev Singh. And I'm working in the area of uh, healthcare IT and data analytics in healthcare. So my, I have a very basic question that uh, I think the major impediment in uh, applying data analytic techniques in any country or organization is the lack of uh, clean, valid, and accurate data that applies more to our uh, Indian uh, security agencies. Second is the lack of uh, enough of uh, data analytics talent, which is lacking in most of the organizations, and they use big data at a very rudimentary level when they analyze it or subject to computational methods. And uh, lastly, I feel is that data is increasingly considered as a strategic asset by any organization, and they're not keen on sharing data. They want to use it exclusively for their own uh, benefit and uh, marketing purposes. So with these three major impediments, uh, what do you suggest that how these can be overcome and how can we move towards uh, uh, data analytics and computational methods. Um, yeah, so I'm going to stay out of the last part, which is intra-organizational, uh, you know, uh, politics and holding on to data. That's, I think, beyond not, you know my technical capabilities. Um, I think that's got to be resolved in some other way, uh, which you know I wouldn't know yeah. the answer to. So, but I, I agree. You know, uh, one does need ways of collating data so uh, dots can be connected and things don't slip through the cracks. Uh, but how to make that happen, uh, you know, from a process and legal perspective, I don't know. I think uh, just the last one for him. Just make your question very quick, please. Uh, thank you, Professor, for an interesting presentation. Uh, it's very interesting to go through the forecasting models. As I'm just finished reading Anti-Fragile by Professor Nassim Talal. <laughs> so uh, I think he cited about black swan, black swan events where which you cannot predict, but you can only prepare for them. So he cited examples of Arab Spring in Middle East, nine, September 9-11, so as banking crisis. So what's, as a forecaster, what's your take on that? Like, uh, uh, um, so first, I haven't read that book. I read the previous book uh, by Taleb. Uh, and um, I think, let me say that, um, uh, let me just say that quants, as forecasting people are called, have done pretty well uh, in terms of accuracy of forecasts in recent elections in the US. Uh, 
uh, the example I'm going to quote is Nate Silver and his book on signal versus noise. I forget the exact title, but it's, it's called something like The Signal and the Noise. Um, however, you're also right that predicting one-off events, as I said earlier, is very difficult. Um, I don't think anybody's got that right, and I would agree with the assertion that if it's possible to be done, it hasn't been shown in a systematic way thus far. Nice question. Um, uh, professor, um, I'm asking a very simple, uh, probably because I am living anachronism, computers indicate that I am. Um, DHS, Department of Homeland Security in US, country of your adoption, uh, has imposed very severe restrictions all over the world in terms of cargo movement in the interest of security, uh, which we in this part of the world feel that is impracticable and imposes tremendous amount of cost and time uh, obligations leading to severe non-tariff barriers. Couldn't a solution based on your sort of modeling be suggested to them as an alternative instead of imposing those severe restrictions which are contrary to the basic concept of liberal trade internationally, why should they not be able to look at some of the possibilities that your modeling offers? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> so, well, I'm uh, not that worried about upsetting Hezbollah. I'm somewhat more worried about upsetting DHS. <laughs> Um, so, I would say that um, uh, we have done no studies. I mean, I would love to see free trade, but uh, all countries, including the U.S., have a right to secure their borders. And uh, if the U.S. government has seen fit to issue certain guidelines that uh, are intended to secure U.S. borders, I am quite confident that they believe they are necessary. Um, I have, of course, not independently validated that, and I certainly cannot claim that the stuff we've done is uh, applicable uh, to detecting, you know, suspicious cargoes. In theory, maybe, but we've provided no evidence to anybody of that, and so uh, I think that's the best I can say. Thank you, Vyaj. It was a great session. Thank you very much.